Hello, guys. My name is Brandon Blankenship. And for the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to talk about passwords and some recent changes. Recent meaning six months ago. But in the IT world, it's usually things change really fast. And so it's really amazing that password changes are still relevant right now, even though it's six, six months ago. The scope of this talk will be fairly non-technical. And I'll talk on salting and hashes. But I'd like to focus on user experience and overall uh, increasing security overall. So we'll talk about the history of what we consider to be good policy on passwords and the changes published last fall that are pretty much 180 degrees from what we've been told for the last 20 years. Also, this talk is from the perspective of the verifier, not the user. It's as though you're the one in your organization that's uh, setting and enforcing password policy. So we can all probably recite the conventional wisdom on good password policy. Call them out if you, if you remember them. Eight character minimum. Number of our case, alpha new max. Yes. <laughs> Don't need a password. <laughs> That's right. So we have six to eight minimum, uppercase, lowercase, number, special character, and it recycles every 30 to 90 days. So this has been gospel in every business and website for the last 15 years. And why? We've all heard the rationale for those complexity rules. It takes brute, it takes an uh, it takes brute force attackers. A long time to grind through all those permutations and we've all heard the stats recited in hours and days and weeks and years so fair enough and that's true on paper but what actually happens remember we're talking about user experience what if the user has 120 separate accounts to keep track of what do users actually do in common uh, special character substitution lead speak which just counts as a word Iteration, password one, password two, password three, which is a response to us making them reset their passwords. They write them down, of course. Uh, they were to put in a Word document called passwords and they leave it on their desktop. <laughs> and, yes, and that's funny, and we, we all laugh and it's true, but we're kind of making them do that, right? <clears throat> they save it in an obscure browser. And my personal favorite is password reuse, which is extremely dangerous that everyone knows, everybody here knows. And yes, I know we have LastPass and other password managers, which are okay and they're good, but I'm kind of torn on that because it introduces a single point of failure. So, but at this point, that's sort of the lesser of two evils. So we can all finger wag at the end user for doing all these silly things, but what I want to point out that at, at its core, it's the rules that are impossible to follow. They have full-time jobs and where they have to remember everything they're expected to do, their daily lives with their kids and families and birthdays and extended relationships. And now we say to them, you must memorize 120 unique gibberish passwords and change at randomly at seemingly random intervals. So that is not a reasonable expectation. So where did all these rules come from? In 2003, uh, a manager from NIST named Bill Burr published an eight-page guide on how to create secure passwords. And for the last 15 years, this has become our Bible. Much of the research on passwords came from a white paper that was written in the 80s, a single white paper, and this was published prior to the internet. All those rules are pretty much from one man. So last August, Bill Burr told the Wall Street Journal that he regrets much of it. And we know and we now know that long passwords that we never write down are far more secure than wacky short ones that we can't, that we can't remember. So here's that comic that I had at the beginning, XKCD, that nails it perfectly. So in the lower left corner, that's where the industry, according to NIST, wants to drive towards is a passphrase that will be become naturally longer than our eight characters or our six characters. And with spaces, because spaces naturally break up words. So, over the last two years, there have been some major rethinking and rewrite of existing password guidelines. NIST has been leading the pack on that, and it's expected that even non-prescriptive standards will follow suit, like HIPAA and the rest. So I want to also point this out. This is kind of a sidebar. Before we get too high and mighty, know that he played a major role in rewriting these new rules. So last August, he got a lot of bad press or a lot of articles about how these rules were bad and it was wrong-headed, and I just don't think that's really true. I personally don't feel like his old guidance was terribly wrong, but there was no reason for us to make that the holy grail of how it must be done. And the fact is we've become overly reliant on passwords. It's just a piece of the security puzzle. 
one factor authentication and it's able to be replayed. Like by its nature, a password is a replay attack. <clears throat> so a little housekeeping on NIST. So they use the word shall, should, may, and can a lot. And the word shall means it's prescriptive. You, you absolutely will do this to be compliant. Should is almost as strong as shall. It means you, you shall do it unless there's a really good reason not to. And may and can mean it's a very good idea. So yeah, here's the main concepts. So for this talk, I'm gonna use shall and should. I'm gonna go back a little bit. For, the, for this talk, shall and should, I'm gonna to lump mm. together to make a very bulleted point to make it easily digestible. So those are the, the seven that I boiled it down to. So no expiration. There's not gonna be any more of this, according to this, there shouldn't be any more of this 30, 60, 90 day expiration business, like literally no expiration. So don't make them reset passwords unless you have a reason to. No complexity rules. Study after study has shown that password complexity rules make properly authenticating users less secure, which I, in my last talk, I had to repeat that to myself because that's hard for me to get in my mind. Study after study has shown that password complexity rules make properly authenticating users less secure. I expect to have a lot of resistance on that point. Maximum of over 64 characters with a minimum of eight. So as an administrator or software developer, you have to accept passwords of 64 characters. And there's no reason you should be limiting them. It could be a thousand for if the user wants it. Storage shouldn't be an issue because you're supposed to be salting and hashing them anyway. So the size should all be the same length. And I'm sure you can remember, like, I've, I've logged into systems where the maximum was 10, and that's really frustrating because you feel like, why would you be limiting how much entropy is into my password? I've even logged into uh, a big boy system that they limit it to eight. Like, they not just limit to eight, they was exactly eight. The minimum and maximum was exactly eight. Awesome. So, yes, all characters accepted. This means ASCII, all ASCII, all Unicode, all foreign language characters, spaces, and emojis. And so two things I wanna point out on that is the, we all think SQL injection, right? So the first character can now be uh, a semicolon and they're being salted and hashed again. So before they even get near your database, SQL injection should not be an issue for your passwords. And spaces, they truncate, if you put multiple spaces in between your words, you're supposed to truncate them down to a single space so you don't lock your users out. It's like an invisible way for them to lock themselves out. So as long as your minimum is not shorter than eight. No hints, no hints, no questions. So it's called uh, knowledge, knowledge based authentication. Um, first grade teacher, your first pet, that sort of thing. In the age of big data, that stuff is very easy to find out. So that's a known. <clears throat> they were very strongly worried about this. This was a shell. So if you have that in your system, find another way to authenticate because that's not secure. Dictionary checks. So most of these changes seem to be loosening tightness, but this one will make a ton of sense to everybody in this room. So the burden is on the administrator to check the password against some sort of dictionary before it's implemented. They don't say what you should use, but it should at least be something common, like John or Hashcat or, or the, some custom one that your red team likes. The reason I like this one is because it directly addresses how most of us will try to get into account. Try to get at the stored hashes and then run them against whatever generic list you happen to have in Kali Linux. And two-factor authentication. So this is more philosophical. If you really want a better level of security, then don't rely on passwords use two-factor or even some something like two-factor and a hardware component if it's really important. But the idea is in our industry, more two-factor is coming as default. So yes, there are a few other things, other bits and bytes that just for completeness sake, I wanna to touch on, but I'm not gonna dwell on these. So for two-factor, when you send it to a user's cell phone, they don't want you using SMS because it's based on a SIM card, which can be easily spoofed. SMS transmissions are not considered secure, so that's considered bad form nowadays. All passwords salted and hashed. These are now requirements, but have long been the norm, so that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Throttling, that's relatively unchanged. So the idea here is we wanna slow down attempts uh, at 
people logging in online. So like CAPTCHA, requiring the claimant to, to wait 30 seconds, and it should increase in between failed login attempts as they get towards lockout. So it could be five minutes, eight minutes, as they near the end. And according to the requirements, I'll read it exactly because I thought it was kind of kind of funny. Shall limit consecutive failed authentication attempts on a single account to no more than 100, which 100 seems kind of high. But then they, the explanation is, the idea is that it's stopping those brute force attacks. It's not stopping somebody sitting there doing it by hand. And if you have it too low, a lot of places do three and done. That's not really preferred because it is a way for a harasser, if they got the username, to lock somebody else out of their account. It'd be like a denial of service against somebody if you got their username. Uh, biometrics. The guidance here is you can't rely on biometrics alone because of the high false positive rate. So it can be used as two-factor authentication, but then it should be audited at 90 plus, a 90% plus uh, accuracy rate. Oh, option for visible passwords, yes. So the option for visible passwords, shoulder surfing isn't really a, as big a deal as we used to think it was. And it's a, it introduces more risk if people mistype their passwords on a cell phone and they have to be constantly reset. <laughs> so yes, so the takeaways here, if you wanna make it difficult for end users to, for end users, they'll always find a way to cheat. And it, you won't achieve the level of security that you want anyway. If we want to have realistic security expectations, two, two factor is going to be required for more things. The password is one factor, and we're realizing that although it's useful, it's not nearly enough for, for security. We don't want to lean on the password too hard. And the basic takeaway at the end I want to leave is we, the more burden on these new guidelines, the more burden is put on the verifier in terms of how they store credentials, the kinds of credentials they accept instead of putting the burden on the users. So yes, does anybody have any questions or open up for discussion? Yes. Um, was the two-factor suggested as a requirement? I don't remember. It's, I don't think it is. I don't think it's a requirement. It's, it's, I think it's a may and can, but we can open it up right now and start hunting through. <laughs> No, that's just a threat. That would be like reading white paper. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, I'm not sure if the two factors, are, but I, I don't think so. I don't think it's a shall. It's more guidance of if we rely on the password for something that's very secure, and you're saying we need complexity or we need long passwords, then that's really not the goal. It should have been thinking of another way, two-factor or three-factor. Yes? Who well, didn't know what SMS? So did they, did they say anything else about what they should recommend? Or like in the document, they did it. Okay. They were they were not they were not prescriptive that way, but the articles I've read say MMS. So when you send a text message by picture, mm -hmm. it's not SMS; it's MMS. So maybe somebody that works in the cell phone industry can say why MMS is more secure than SMS. But I don't know. That's, yeah, that's weird. So when you first said that, I thought it was because they were worried about somebody stealing somebody's phone. Yes. Yeah. Well, right. And logging into it, but it sounds like they're worried more about the transport of SMS. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's forwarding, thing. like forwarding. Okay. Messages yeah. coming back stuff. And then if you send a picture message, yeah, the message there's HTTP yeah. more to, yeah. more to yeah. track down. The bits and bytes, why? I don't know why, but that was the guidance in that. Wow. Well, you probably should steer away from anything related to your your cell service because uh, there have been several uh, times where people call your your you know uh, cell phone provider and convince them to change like the SIM card mm -hmm. to a different one and suddenly some other random schmuck has your phone. Yeah, yeah that's so, becoming increasing. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, I mean, customer service has been forever taught, you know, make them happy. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I know that NIST, they even, they do not recommend uh, two-factor over SMS. They explicitly, they came out as yeah, they right. use it. Yeah. They didn't give a, an alternate good way or do it. Right. So they just, don't I wonder recommend something else, because I think there's some other ones that are just as, I wouldn't trust as much as SMS. Right. Right. I, had, I had places they'll email to me. Right, not, that, that, not that's not two-factor. That. I mean, yeah. That's something you know and something right. you know. They, they email you to tell them. Yep. Right. For the password that we used to send them to, you know, to. <laughs> <laughs> I find it interesting that they keep a minimum of eight. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, how? So if we if we strip away everything but the minimum of eight, all the all the previous requirements <coughs> still exist there, right? Yep. So will the users change? I think that the concept is if you allow people to do passphrases, it will naturally drift up into that twelve to sixteen range. 
because people are choosing words. If you make them do random gobbledygook, then they're going to do the exact <clears throat> minimum because they can't remember anymore. Yeah, they're going to choose to go rid of Right. That's, that's the kind of thinking. The other thing I was thinking is it's kind of, I'm like, I understand why they wouldn't make two factor requirement. There's a lot of other software development requirements that can complicate things. But like when you have two factor, everything else kind of just, I kind of want to say it doesn't matter, like from a practical standpoint. Right. Because it's like your, your password is essentially rotating every 60 seconds, and it's a possible one password out of like, what, 99,000 different passwords? Like nobody's going to be guessing that within 60 seconds on anything is that's. It? Like the RSA tokens. Yeah. 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 So like if you have two factor, I mean like your password could be A. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. When was this published? I want to say August or September last year. It was it was late last week. It was, it was, it was, it was yeah, recent. It was last year. So were you guys you when you do your standards where you were? Oh we, yeah. We talked about it and push it, yeah. And that's, no, I'm just oh. curious because I'm how do I go back to Oh my boss, hey, we're going to get rid of all these rules and we're just put in our it's security policy that we're ready to publish. Yeah. And I go, what? <laughs> it's resistance. It's a, you'll get a lot of resistance because, you know, users and executives, you have to go to them and say, just like you said, hey, guess what? The thing that we've said is true for the last 20 years. We, so, it, just kidding. I'm, sorry, I didn't know. Go, go um, I've implemented something very similar to this with a company, a medium sized business that had the standard, you know, Microsoft complex standards. The biggest draw for them was the no expiry. So people were really sick. We had other things on top, like you couldn't have, uh, if three letters were consecutive in your password that matched your first or last name, you could have, couldn't have those either. And um, you couldn't reuse back like, I think the previous four passwords. So it was a little, little more stringent than this. But the way we rolled it out is we made it a minimum of 16 and then did no expiration and told them, you know, if, if you want to, you know, 16 seems like a lot, but think of like just a phrase or a piece of a chorus of a song that you know, because we had no top end. So you can make it as big as you want and it's never going to expire. And for us, the biggest sell was the no expiration date, because that, that's what people seem to get the most hung up on is, you know, every, every freaking three months, man, did that's you, what change day. Did you implement two factor there? Um, yeah, but it was unrelated. It was for a business use case with Amazon. I was going to say, if you don't have no expiry with, or two factor with no expiry, then you open yourself to phishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the, the key, the one of the other keys to having a no expiry and a longer, longer password is you have to have a, a blue team or a security team that's on top of it and watching for things. Because if the first indication of compromise, you need to get that, that password out of there. Otherwise, they're going to free rank to that user, and then they're just going to leak out of there. So I guess that's, that's probably one of my problems with the no expiry is that I've been on numerous pen tests where I found some creds in a, in a file somewhere. I mean, just standard IP mess ups. Like, it, it happens everywhere. But they were like, we haven't used that account for years. And it's just like, but you have no expiry. If it was expired, I yeah. wouldn't be able to use it. Wow. But since they had no expiry, I just. I guess it means a trade off. So and, and that's, that's which valid. is why I like his suggestion of increasing the the minimum amount of characters. That that at least that at least uh, prevents me from easily writing dictionary attacks against people. Oh, okay. I wouldn't fix it, but you just described the problem. Right. If it was written in the password, no. It's five and four five. Yeah, it's your password. You still but if that. it's right. but if it is an eight minimum character, I can easily crack that. Right. Oh yeah. It doesn't mean it's throwing other factors to block out. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, I guess I, I think I have like an inherent problem with the no expiration. I think it's more of a user-based problem, though, because they haven't had a user account logged in for a year. They have other problems on their right. procedural side. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, yeah. Not, that's <laughs> not affording issue. Right, right. but they're not making those recommendations. I mean, like, I guess I haven't read the documents. I don't actually know, but, like, no, I, mean, I guarantee they're not. Yeah. Because this is going to be. They would say that's somebody else's problem. Yeah. We're just talking about passwords. Yeah. But, yeah. Your consideration of passwords is taking into making assumptions. Yeah. yeah, passwords don't exist in a vacuum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so the other interesting point I ran into this lately with um, some PCI folks is that you got to remember that password complexity and rules are enforced on the 
on the user and credential store, right? AD or whatever mm -hmm. you have it sources. Applications also use yes. AD to authenticate to other applications. So this is probably where you're trying to go on the password and just config file and change the code you're using, right? But at least that's what it's common. So not only do you start running into more complex password change issues when things do expire often, right? So now you're banking, you're, you're using your password ex expiration to enforce good config management, which is maybe okay, but when shit breaks and security gets blamed, then nobody really wins, right? Yeah. So, so applications sort of using credentials makes all this money too, because they're sort of bastardizing passwords, because it's not something the application knows, it's something the application has is configured as a token, but it's, it's really yeah, a password, it's a good username and password. Why don't they just have an API key and see what it's right. Like, right? But that complex, that complicates all of this. Um, and then in PCI, you run into things like, well, we have to second factor everywhere. And then everybody has to stand up and say, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What about the applications? What about the security applications that log in and do authenticated scanning? My, scan, my, my scanning tool doesn't do two-factor authentication. What are we gonna do there? Right, are we gonna shim pam config so that you can give us an exception or? Well, the good thing, I, was, I, I guess my response to that would be like, <clears throat> NIST is not a legislative you know, body. Right. It's, it's, not, it's not like, you know. But it's those not letters look good in a policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. NIST says, not yeah. our fault, NIST says. And it is, it's most, things are it driven off. most things are driven off. It is. And I, and I guess the legislative stuff, 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 or at least the compliance like drivers are going to be basing their decisions off of that stuff. Yeah, for sure. And and your compliance is a bare minimum, right? Like it's something that, it's a target that you I must hit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a target that you must hit to be minimally compliant. Like you should be going way above and beyond that. But yeah. Jesus Christ, it's realistic. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the overall concept is when we force users to reset their passwords all the time, they forget their passwords and they have to use that tool to reset them and that introduces risk. So we're trying to, yes, it'd be nice if, if they reset every 30 days and it was a completely random one that they could remember and never wrote down, but that's just not the, how the reality of it will be. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is you set one, you get your email account, you set one giant password on it, and then you just forget your password on everything else and one time pad every time you log in, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what he said. I think you're right. That's what I heard. 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 That's a big phone. Right? I'm trying to give you trouble. I had a similar argument on the Perfect. number of passwords. So when I started working at the university, uh, Dad, he's not here tonight, otherwise I'd call him out. Embarrassing, but he, no, not embarrassing, but his point was he hates all SSO. All SSO is bad. And my argument was, well, in this environment, I have 50,000 effing passwords. Yeah, How yeah. much do you, I mean, I'm using a password to say that I'm a security guy. How many of the rest of these jokers is developers? What developer do you know that could have a different password for all 50,000? It's not. Right? You're encouraging password reuse, right? You're encouraging yeah. the things that maybe you don't want to have because you think SSO is inherently insecure. Now, maybe it's insecure for using for everything, yeah. right? But some commonality doesn't occur either. That's another uh, good point. The, the password reuse, when you change that minimum, from eight to sixteen for us. Yeah. One of the other the benefits there was saying, look, you know, we went, we pulled these pwned people from our organization who were using these passwords. They're using the same passwords on ours. So now with a minimum sixteen, it's going to be more than whatever that website was because that website limited to eight. So they're, you know, we're now safe from that password reuse from that person for now. And you know, but just other arguments to make for that the benefit of, of changing the, the scope of the passwords there. That's a good point. If you're not using a password safe, you're already using passwords. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. I, I just yeah. checked. I have 342 passwords yeah. in my in my yeah. dashboard. And, and, and that's not all. And if you have a password safe, you're using one password to access all the passwords. Yep. <laughs> so, so if your browser is compromised, like a key logger. Right. Does anyone have else have any <laughs> conversations? This guy sucks. <laughs> 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 Burn it all down. <laughs> Done. That's a number for everyone. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.